Hi there, Mr. Holcomb here with another episode of The Math Behind the Modules. Welcome to Lesson 13, Relationships Between Two Numerical Variables. Classwork, not all relationships between two numerical variables are linear. Okay, so they're not always linear. There are many situations where the pattern in the scatter plot would best be described by a curve. Two types of functions often used in modeling nonlinear relationships are quadratic and exponential functions. Example one, modeling relationships. Sometimes the pattern in the scatter plot looks like the graph of a quadratic function. So this looks like a parabola, which is a graph of a quadratic function with the points falling roughly in the shape of a U that opens up or down, as in this graph below. So as X increases, Y is decreasing until we get to this point right here at 50. Then X continues to increase, but Y starts to increase. So Y decreases and then increases, so that's what's going to give us the U shape. In other situations, the pattern in the scatter plot might look like the graphs of exponential functions that either are upward sloping graph one or downward sloping graph two. So in this situation, as X is increasing, so too is Y. Y is getting larger with X. In graph two, a downward sloping exponential function, as X is increasing, Y decreases to a certain point. Okay, page two. Um, this electronic version of the student edition, I think, is a little wacky. This graph is supposed to be on the prior page, and then it's duplicated here, so I'll just skip that. Exercise 1 through 6 says to consider, again, the five scatter plots discussed in the previous lesson. This first scatter plot was age in years and number of cell phone calls. So as you get older, the values tend to seem to decrease in number of phone calls. And then scatter plot two was the tortilla chips. The more you fry them, the less moisture content. Scatter plot three was price in dollars and a quality rating. And then age in years with respect to, um, does that say finish time? Okay, and I'm just going to continue because this, because this is not lined up properly. The five are not on the same page. So scatter plot five is blank, and it says mare weight in kilograms, fowl weight in kilograms. So we're talking about horses and some type of bird. So question number one says, which of the five scatter plots from lesson 12 shows a pattern that can be reasonably described by a quadratic curve? So if we go back, we're looking at, so let's um, draw in some line, the ones that have linear so this would look kind of linear. This one doesn't seem to have much of a correlation at all. It's just random. So there's no relationship in scatter plot three. Um, and if I do a curve, let me try this one. Okay. This one would go to here. So as you can see, there's kind of a curve here. Let's see if I can get that to fit a little better. So like something like that. Okay, so that one's got the curve. And this one, let me just do with the pen. I'll choose blue. This one tends to come down like so. Okay. This one doesn't seem to have much of a relationship at all. So in answering the next question here, question number one, which of the five scatter plots from lesson 12 shows a pattern that could be reasonably described by a quadratic curve? Well, looking at these, it's scatter plot four. Okay, so scatter plot four discussed with students how the pattern in scatter plot fits the quadratic curve. So let's see. 
as you can see, as X is increasing the whole time, Y starts high, but Y starts to decrease down to this point. It goes from this point all the way down to here, 300 and something down to below 200, down a little further, then turns and Y begins to increase again. And this is all while the X is increasing. We're going from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 300 down to under 200, down even lower, back up to 200, up to 225, and then back up to over 275. So that is definitely a quadratic curve. Number four, which of the five scatter plots shows a pattern that can be reasonably described as an exponential curve? So going back, remember from the prior page, an exponential curve going up is this one, and an exponential curve going down is this one. So that looks like scatter plot. Two. So as X increases, Y is decreasing, but it's not linear like number one, it's curved. So it's scatter plot two. Okay, so number two is scatter plot two. Now it says, let's revisit the data on elevation in feet above sea level and the mean number of clear days per year. The scatter plot of this data is shown below. Okay, again, this is off, so let me go get it. It's right here. So let me copy this and bring it back up to the page we're on. Okay, that's better. So the plot also shows a straight line that can be used to model the relationship between elevation and the mean number of clear days. So as elevation increases, the number of clear days seems to increase as well. Fairly strong linear relationship. In grade eight, you're, you informally fit a straight line to a model to model the relationship between two variables. The next lesson shows more formal way to fit a straight line. The equation of this line is y equals 83.6 plus 0.008x. Now let's just review that a little bit. The 83.6, you might be familiar with a linear equation being written like y equals mx plus b. Remember that? m is our slope or our rate of change. b is our y-intercept. Well, this is the same thing, but only in the form of y equals b plus mx. And we can do this because of the commutative property of addition. a plus b is equal to b plus a. It doesn't matter what order. 3 plus 1 is 4. 1 plus 3 is 4. It doesn't matter which way we align our equation up of our elements in our equation, addition is, order does not matter. So this is the form that they're using here. They're just putting the y-intercept first. So this is our y-intercept, 83.6. Here's 75, here's 100, there's 83.6 right there. 0.008x means that for every x increasing by one, the y is going to increase by eight one thousandths. Okay, and that's giving you a gradual increase as we go from left to right. Okay, so here's page four. I brought the equation over. Here's the graph. Assuming that the 14 cities used in this scatter plot are representative of the cities across the United States, should you see more clear days per year in Los Angeles, which is near sea level, or in Denver, which is known as the Mile High City? Justify your choice with a line showing the relationship between elevation and mean number of clear days. Okay, so we'd say we would say that Denver probably has the more has more clear days since number of clear days increases as elevation increases, and. Um, for example, let's just take a look at Los Angeles, which says which is near sea level. So sea level is around zero feet above the sea. So if X is zero, and that's elevation above sea level, so LA is zero, LA's equation would be Y equals 83.6 plus 0 0.008 times zero if LA is right at sea level. It's a little bit higher than sea level, but not much. So when we multiply that, we get Y equals 
83.6 because 0 0.008 times 0 is 0 and 83.6 plus 0 is 83.6 feet. So this point right here, 83.6 feet, would be, I'll do it in green, Los Angeles would be represented by that green dot. So now I'm going to do the same thing, let me erase this, with the Mile High Stadium, or Mile High City. The reason it's called Mile High is because it's about a mile above sea level, which is 5,280 feet. One mile is 5,280 feet. So here's 5,000, here's 6,000, 5,280 is probably right around here. So we would use the equation and say y equals 83.6 plus 0 0.008 times 5,280. So instead of doing long multiplication, I'll just get the calculator out. And take 83.6 plus 0 0.008 eight times 5,280. And that will give me an answer of 125.84. So that's going to be 125.84 feet above sea level. So 125 is right here. So to make things clearer, let me draw a straight line up and then from over from 125 and the point that would be representative of Denver is going to be, let me use the same green, is going to be, whoops, a point, is going to be right here. Okay, so here's LA, here's Denver. And they're both right on that line, obviously, because we use the equation of the line. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense to you. So what this means is Los Angeles has approximately 83.6 clear days a year. And Denver has about 125 or 126 clear days per year. Okay, number four says one of the cities in the data set was Albany, New York which has an elevation of 275 feet. If you do not know the mean number of clear days for Albany, what would you predict the number to be based on the line that described the relationship between elevation and mean number of clear days? Okay, so in order to do this, here's the key. Elevation is our X. So we let X equal 275. Putting that in our equation here, we get y equals 83.6 plus 0 0.008 times 275. Putting that in our calculator, we would get um, 83.6 plus 0 0.008 times 275. And that would give us an answer about 85.8. Okay, so the prediction would be approximately 85.8 days. That would be clear. Another way we could have done that is um, gone to 275 feet, but it's hard when this is at 1,000 because here would be 500. 250 would be here. 275 is approximately here, and then we could go up and go over and see where we are on this line, and it's around 80-something, and there it is, 85.8. Okay, number five. Another city in the data was set was Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's where Bugs Bunny took a wrong turn. Albuquerque has an elevation of 5,311 feet. If you did not know the mean number of clear days for Albuquerque, what would be your predicted number to num predict this number to be based on the line that describes the relationship between elevation and mean number of clear days? So here, this is going to be our elevation again, which is our x. So we're going to let x 
equal 5,311. And we're going to substitute that into our equation. So let me just erase this. So we're using the same equation. I'm running out of room here, so let me slide that over here a little bit. And it's 83.6 plus 0 .008 times x, which is now 5,311. And then if we go back to our calculator, um, then it would be 83.6 plus 0 .008 parentheses 5311. Enter. Okay, so our approximation would be approximately 126, I'd say 126. Uh, well, that'd be point one. Let's just round approximately 126 days since we're talking days. All right, so approximately 126 days. Uh, number six says, what, what's the prediction of the mean number of clear days based on the line closer to the actual value for Albany with 69 clear days or Albuquerque with 167 clear days? Okay, so here what they're basically saying is, was our prediction closer to the actual? They're giving us the actual now. Albany was 69 clear days, and we predicted 85.8. So 85.8 minus 69.0 is 16.8 difference. We're off by 16.8 days with our using our linear equation. Now if we go to Albuquerque, its actual clear days was 167. We came out with 126. I'll do that over here. So it's 167 minus 126, leaving us a difference of 41. So obviously we were much closer, 16.8 days, than Albuquerque's 41 days. So Albany was the one where we were closer. So let's put that into words. Okay, so the prediction, 86 clear days, was closer for Albany, which has 69 actual clear days. The distance from the predicted point on the line to the point re representing Albany showed a smaller distance than the point corresponding to Albuquerque. So they're talking about distance on the graph. So if I were to come up to this graph and plot those points is what they were talking about. I'll use green. Whoops. Okay, I dragged my toolbar down there, my fault. So let's go back to here. All right, so we're going to plot these points. So for Albany, Albany is 69 instead of 85.8. So the 85.8, here's 75, here's 100. This was the original Albany right here. That's the predicted, 85.8. It was actually 69, so here's 50, here's 75. Um, 69 would be about here. Albuquerque was a prediction of 126 days. Here's 125, here's 126, it's 5,280. Albuquerque prediction would have been here, but the actual was 167 clear days. So it's so far up, 167 would be way up here. So there's Albuquerque right there. So what they're basically saying is, to compare these two points and these two points and which one was closer to this line. So this one's obviously way higher than this one being lower. And that's what that question was asking. Okay, page five of lesson 13 brings us to example two, a quadratic model. Farmers sometimes use fertilizers to increase crop yield, but often wonder just how much fertilizer they should use. 
The data shown in the scatter plot below are from a study of the effect of fertilizer on yield of corn. Data source is from M.E. Carato and A.M. Blackmer. Comparison of models for describing corn yield response to nitrogen fertilizer, 1990. Agronomy Journal. Okay, so exercise seven through nine is going to ask questions about this graph. Number seven says the researchers who conducted the study decided to use a quadratic curve to describe the relationship between yield and amount of fertilizer. Explain why they made this choice. Okay, well, if I were to draw a straight line like so. The data is represented well up until this point, but then it breaks away from the curve and turns. If I were to take that same line and rotate it, like so, it's not lining up with this piece or this piece, just the center. So if I turn it so that it's lined up with these, then these aren't being represented well. So a straight line does not work. So they said, well, let's try a curve. So I don't want to use red. So it looks like it is doing this. Okay, so there is your quadratic curve. So putting it into words, we would say in the beginning, as the amount of fertilizer X increases, so does the yield Y. But then around 250 kilos, which is right about here, the, the yield begins to decrease. I cut that off. It's yield. Oh, yield. Yield, what you get from the... That should be yield. The yield begins to decrease as the amount of fertilizer increases. Okay, so it's decreasing from about 225 here and down. Okay, or 250. All right, number eight, the model that the researchers used to describe the relationship was y equals 0.47 plus 0.05x minus 0.0001x squared, where x represents the amount of fertilizer kilograms per 10,000 square meters and Y represents the corn yield, yield milligrams per 10,000 square meters. Use the quadratic model to complete the following table, then sketch the graph of this quadratic equation on the scatter plot. Okay, so there's a couple of ways we can do this. We can look at the, tape, the graph and find the point where x is zero and find a y value that would go with that. So when x is zero, well, we could have just under four, a little more than four, a little more than five. So our y-intercept could be any one of these three. Then we go to 100 and we come up and there's a point, it would probably be right about here, that'd be around eight point something and continue doing it that way. But I'm gonna show you a different way. I'm going to go to my calculator so if you're going to follow this, get your graphing calculator. Hopefully you have a TI-84+. plus. You can also get this edition for free online. Just Google Wabbit EMU. Okay, so turn this on, clear. And what I'm going to do is put this equation. Whoops. I'm going to put this equation into my graphing calculator. So I'm going to go to Y equals and clear any data that's already there. And I'm going to put 4.7 plus 0.05x minus 0.0001x squared. Okay, now if I hit zoom six, that's zoom fit, it doesn't look like much, does it? Well, if I look at my table here, I could use these parameters for my window. So if I go to window, my X minimum, I'm just going to go to negative one just so I see a little bit past the axis. 
and my x maximum is 400. So I'm going to put a 400 in for my x maximum. Leave the scale alone. Y minimum, well, we're never going below zero. So I will just put negative one just so I can see the x axis. And then y maximum, the highest number up here, is, isn't quite 11, so let's make our maximum 11. And now if I hit graph, then there's our parabola. Pretty cool, huh? All right, so I just used that window. So now I can go in and look at the, now that the graph is there, I can now go to second graph for my table, and I can go up to, and I can plug in the values I want. I want zero, and I'm gonna put 100, 200, 300, 400. 100, 200, 300, 400. And I'll delete the rest. Okay, so there is our table. So I'm going to put zero, 4.7. 100 is 8.7. 200 was 10.7. 300 is 10.7. And 400 was 8.7. So as you see, Y increased, leveled off, and started to decrease again. So there's our table and how to do it with the graphing calculator. Number nine says, based on this quadratic model, how much fertilizer per 10,000 square meters would you recommend that a farmer use on his cornfield in order to maximize crop yield? Justify your choice. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna go up to the graph and I'm looking for a maximum. So my maximum is right around here. So if I go straight down, from these points, this is my highest point. It came up, that's the highest, and it starts to decrease again. I would say my maximum was right around, now this is 100, so this would be 250. And 225, so I'd say 230, 240, somewhere around there. All right, so somewhere in that vicinity. Okay, so about 225 to 250 kilograms per 10,000 square meters. Now we could have been a lot more accurate and found the maximum, which is the axis of symmetry. The vertex is negative B over 2A, but we could just leave it at this by looking at the graph. Okay, here's the next page, but before I go any further, I wanna show you another way to find the maximum using the calculator rather than just estimating. So if you put in your y equals equation and hit graph and you know your window so you can see the whole thing, you see this CALC, that means calculate, and it's in blue. So that tells you to push the blue button to get that arrow there to use the upper command of the, word, of the button trace. So if I push second trace, that's my calculate. And then number four says maximum. So then I come down and I choose four. So my cursor is sitting there flashing. So it says left bound. That just means move the cursor to the left of where the maximum is. So I'm just going to move it down here. So I know that's to the left of the maximum. And I hit enter. Then it says right bound. Well, now I'm going to move over to the other side. Just hold that button down and it zooms over to the other side. And now I'm to the right right bound, I'm to the right side of this maximum. And then I hit enter, and then it says guess question mark, and then you hit enter again, and it will put a point right there and tell you that the maximum is 250.0000000001, which is just 250 approximately, and the Y value is 10.95. So 250 was the maximum yield or no, 10.95. 10.95 was the maximum yield of corn when we used 250 fertilizer. Was it grams? Let's go back real quick. Um, okay, so that was right here, maximizing. All right, so got to go back a couple because this is all messed up. 
All right, so it was milligrams per 10,000 square meters. Milligrams, okay. Those milligrams. So my 250 milligrams per would give me the 10.95 grams of corn. All right, anyway, now example three. An exponential model. How do you tell how old a lobster is? Can't just ask it, it won't answer you. This question is important to biologists and those who regulate lobster trappers. Trapping. To answer this question, researchers recorded data on the shell length of 27 lobsters that were raised in the laboratory and whose ages were known. Okay, so here's the graph. Exterior shell length in millimeters, age in years, and it's blank. And there's a break here because 75 to 100 is a distance of 25. And this looks like a distance of 25, but it's actually starting from, not starting from zero, but skipping over to 75. So that's why we break there. Number 10 says, the researchers who conducted this study decided to use an exponential curve to describe the relationship between age and exterior shell length. Explain why they made this choice. Well. This whole lesson has been uh, messed up as far as pages and everything. And this, I believe, should have a scatter plot in it. So just give me a moment here. Okay, so here's the graph, and they already drew a red line in on it. Um, okay, so there's all the dots that represent individual lobsters. There were 27 of them. I'm not going to count them. The researchers who conducted this study decided to use an exponential curve, and there it is, that red curve, to describe the relationship in age between the exterior shell length. Explain why they made this choice. Okay, so as x is increasing, y is increasing as well, but it isn't in a linear fashion. So if I were to draw a straight line and say I started here, and work my way up like this. Okay, so obviously it's not on that line. Okay, I can move that, say, like right about there. So these dots are above, then it fits a little bit better here, but then these dots go back above again. So it is definitely not linear. All right. So we could say, as the length of the exterior shell increases, okay, the exterior shell, as it's increasing, going this way, the age of the lobster tends to increase. The change in age is greater as the shell length increases, suggesting an exponential model. So what they're saying is, as we get up here, the, the age increases. So the shell length, as we're increasing in shell length, the age starts to increase faster. Okay, number 11 says, the model that the researchers used to describe the relationship is y equals 10 to the power of negative 0.403 plus 0.0063x, where x represents the exterior shell length in millimeters, and y represents the age of the lobster in years. The exponential curve is shown on the scatter plot below. Does this model provide a good description of the relationship between age and the exterior shell lengths? Explain why or why not. So what they're asking is, is this a bad, a good fit? Does that line represent the dots well? So my answer to that would be, the model does a good job of describing the relationship. The data points lie reasonably close to that model. Okay, number 12 says, based on this exponential model, what age is a lobster with an exterior shell length of 100 millimeters? I'm going to show you two different ways to do this. First off, I'm going to show you where, let's use blue. So they're saying 100 millimeters. So if I put my cursor right here at 100 and go up to that red line right there, and then draw the same line over to the y-axis, like so, that will give us our value. 
So it's looking at a little more than 1.5, maybe 1.7, but an algebraic way to do that would be to use the equation. So if I use um, the model y equals 10 to the power of negative 0 0.403, plus 0.0063x, then we will get a value. So I'm going to go to my calculator, go to y equals, clear that last equation, and put 10 to the power of negative 0 0.403 plus 0.0063x and hit graph. Okay, so that's going up a lot faster. Remember our window. If you're going to do this in the calculator, they're giving you the window values in your x and y axis. So I go to window, and my x minimum, I like negative 1 just to show the graph, the axis, and x maximum here is 150. So I'm going to change that from 400 to 150. It will just look better. And then my y maximum is only 4.5. So I'll just say 5. And then graph. Okay, and there is a much better fit of that equation. Now if I go to second graph, and let's delete all these values from that last table, and I want to know when it's 100 millimeters. So I put 100 in here. And it will calculate that for me in the equation. And that gives me a value of 1.6866. Okay? Or approximately 1.69 years old. Number 13. Suppose that trapping regulations require that any lobster with an exterior shell length less than 75 millimeters or more than 150 must be released based on the exponential model. What are the ages of the lobsters with the exterior shell lengths less than 75 millimeters? What are the ages of the lobsters with exterior shell lengths greater than 150? Explain how you got that answer. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this line over to 75. Okay, so what that means is, let me get that right on there. Okay, that's close. What that means is and these four lobsters were too small, too young to keep, so they're required to release them. I don't want this to go beyond that red line. I want it to go to it. Okay, and same goes with this. I'll bring this over like so, and shorten that to the y-axis. And that will give me my answer. So right there, it looks like it's approximately 1.2. All right, same goes with the biggies, the big guys. All right, so big guys and gals. So if those um, lobsters are large, they're required to release them as well. So they can only keep lobsters between 75 and 150 millimeters. So I'm going to draw another line like I just did. And that would be here, here, and this time I will use uh, green. So now we're talking 150. So we draw a line straight up there, and then from there over to here. And so that gives us just shy of 3.5. Okay, so putting that into words, lobsters less than 75 millimeters, that's the blue right here, be about a year old or less, that's about 1.2 actually. And lobsters that are more than 150 millimeters would be approximately 3.5 years or older. 150 brings us to approximately 3.5 years and older. Okay. This is page, I don't know, seven, eight, nine. I lost track with the way this was laying out in this video for some reason. But anyhow, 
This page brings us to the end of lesson 13. Review the lesson summary and go do your problem set.